there's a beauty, beautiful thing in Bitcoin that some of the most important developers in it have no say over mm. how users use this public good. And I do hope we move away from sort of just bastard, bastardizing these Ethereum use cases onto Bitcoin. I hope we move away from that. But, you know, for now, you know, they pay the fee. They want to pay our miners and subsidize our security uh, and put their economic activity in the best money known to man. I'm not going to stop them. Uh, and, and not only that, I can't stop them. Yeah. It's really the fundamental beauty of this whole thing is whatever Bitcoin is, it's an open source tool. And how that tool is used is ultimately up to each individual making use of it. And so what we get, like the collective outcome of that is, is Bitcoin is this consensus driven social construct. We, like who, who am I or who are you or who is anyone to say what it is or what it should be? That's like rendering a value judgment onto someone else. It's actually up to the users, right? Individually. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Mark Goodwin, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thanks, Robert. Uh, happy to be here, man. Thanks so much. It's great to have you. Um, this is the first time we've spoken, actually. And just by way of quick introduction, you are the director of editorial for the print magazine over at Bitcoin Magazine. And you've been a Bitcoiner for five, six years um, and I guess us taking the opportunity to talk today is because we are headed into the biggest event of the year for you guys, which is the Bitcoin conference 2023 in Miami, starting on May 18th, 18th through the 20th, I believe. Um, what's that all about? What can, what can we expect to see at the Bitcoin conference this year? Oh yeah. I, I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, uh, the first Bitcoin conference uh, I went to was in 2019, and I actually just worked it as a bartender. Uh, I requested for the shift so that I could work the event because I had been in Bitcoin right. for a couple of years. But uh, yeah, I've been uh, San Francisco in 2019, and um, yeah, just kind of slowly got to know the Bitcoin Magazine folks, going to meetups and all that. Um, and then uh, yeah, got to go last year. I got brought on uh, to the team to uh, help restart the print magazine. Uh, right before the conference last year, so that was kind of my like big, you know, dropping in the in the deep end moment. And uh, man, what a what a great time! Um, so yeah, this year it's gonna be absolutely insane. We got 
presidential candidates. We got some amazing journalists, incredible authors, um, and just, you know, everybody who's anybody is, is going to be there. Um, yeah, I'm getting, it's starting to feel real, you know, we're coming down to, we got about a week left. So, you know, last minute packing and all that stuff, but, um, yeah, it's going to be really, really, really amazing. Uh, I'm helping out with the book signing. Um, we got Michael Lewis is signing books. We got a bunch of incredible authors. Um, yeah, it's going to be a real jamboree for sure. For sure. For sure. I right, said, so, yeah, I, <clears throat> The first one I attended also was Bitcoin 2019 in San Francisco. And I remember Bitcoin was going through quite the parabolic price move at the time, like right during the conference. So it was such a such an interesting vibe. Yeah. And that was the right direction, but <laughs> No, no, it was going in the right direction actually. It was going up during 2019. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. It had made a move off of like a three thousand dollar price floor, and it had just been running. And during the conference, it was hitting like twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand, before it started to correct back down. That's right. And um, I just always remember that because the timing was too interesting, and the the energy was extra high <laughs> because of the Bitcoin yeah, price move. There's always like funny, like uh, <clears throat> price movements around you know big traveling in the Bitcoin community. You know, everyone. Uh, you know, we had a little dip today. Maybe that's people getting their last minute tickets and all that, uh, getting their <laughs> flights and everything. Um, but it is just like wild. Like, you know, obviously, you know, market movement stuff is that that's, I'm a little bit joking there, but, but it really is a, a pretty transformative experience for just like, like how many projects have come together, how many, uh, you know, partnerships and, and obviously, you know, not to mention the friendships. Um, and I'm sure romantic stuff too, I'm sure. Um, but just getting everyone together. Uh, you know, there's so much, you know, and, and Twitter's the best for this, of course, but it, it, it's, it's kind of meant to be sort of like a Socratic argumentative, uh, sort of platform. And then you get into, you know, you know, uh, real life with Bitcoiners and you just see like, we have 99.9% .9 of everything that we believe in, in common with each other, mm -hmm. even we're considered in different tribes and all these things. And. And just whenever you can get everyone together, I remember at the, uh, you know, there was a little music festival at the end of the conference last year and just kind of sitting with all these absolute hooligans, uh, you know, at this like picnic table out, out front. And just like, I, I remember kind of getting like, it was kind of getting a little over, you know, like emotional. It was just like, mm -hmm. I can't believe all these people are here. Um, I can't believe I'm a part of this thing. There's so much work to do, but it's like, I just spent, you know, three days just getting my mind absolutely blown by all these ideas um, and, and all these really good hearted, incredibly smart people. Um, there's really nothing like it. I mean, and I love all the Bitcoin conferences and, you know, I've been, you know, privileged enough to go to a handful of them. Um, but, you know, Miami, you know, or Bitcoin conference, I should say, is certainly the, uh, the, the biggest and, and longest still running at this point. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's a really special time. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to, you know, I mean, last year I spent, I'd say 80% of my time at the, uh, open source stage and just, you know, learning about so many of the projects and people that are now dominating, you know, kind of this, uh, this, uh, this new cycle of looking at, you know, other scaling solutions and privacy solutions. And, um, you know, a lot of the open source stuff is, you know, popping off there's grants, getting sent off left and right. There's actual projects that kind of went from these white papers into really tangible, you know, financial services and seeing that, you know, kind of come out this like germination of, you know, and of course they'd been working on these ideas long before Miami, but to get them on stage and to present them. And then, you know, now here we are and we're seeing, you know, Fediment and Cashew and, uh, you know, even Ordinals, you know, Casey was just spoke on the open source stage last year. And, and so just, kind of seeing all these people now kind of like stepping up uh in, in really big ways um it's wild it's really awesome to see yeah the bitcoin community is the best and i think miami is you know just kind of by default the biggest one and uh you know getting all the getting all the fellas and gals together is uh is, is a treat for sure definitely i um i was at the gym today and a guy two guys recognized me from whatever the show i guess and they were like, oh, thanks for orange billing me, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I have some extra GA tickets. So I actually just offered them up to those guys. So, yeah, come on down to Miami. 
and they seem pretty pumped. Um, you know, the thing this is where I always really encourage people to go and check out a live Bitcoin event if you are a Bitcoiner. So as you said, Bitcoin Twitter is one type of environment where people are, let's say, smashing their ideas against one another. It's very adversarial, very argumentative at times. Um, and if you're an outsider looking in, you might think that Bitcoiners tend to be conflictual in that way. And like, and the actual experience of being in real life at a conference with a lot of Bitcoiners is quite the opposite, actually. Um, I usually just call it a love fest. I mean, people are are just high fiving and hugging and laughing and having a great time. And I'm convinced it has something to do with when you're in Bitcoin and you're a Bitcoiner, you're automatically ethically and economically aligned with every other Bitcoiner, right? Like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is all about do not steal human freedom, individual sovereignty. And then also you're economically aligned in the sense that even Bitcoin companies that are competitive to each other are both vested in seeing the network itself succeed. So it's kind of like this cooperative competition. Um, and I, I think it goes maybe in a step further than that is when, when you're on a sound monetary standard, every successful business venture that improves human productivity increases the purchasing power of savers. So everyone saving in the hard money benefits from the increase in productivity. So this subtle incentive shift of moving from a soft money to a hard money standard, all of a sudden, I, I genuinely, legitimately want you to succeed at whatever business thing you're doing, even if it's competitive to me, because if you succeed, that means you've moved the needle on human productivity. That means the purchasing power of my savings has gone up. So there's this fundamental ethical and economical alignment among Bitcoiners that really seems to be manifest when you when you go to these in-person experiences. And um, quite selfishly, <laughs> I also just love getting mobbed with love, like people thanking me for the show or thanking me for things I've written or whatever it is. Uh, it feel, feels really good to add value to other people's lives and have them acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah. Bitcoin is such a unique thing. I mean, you're a thousand percent right about all the economic incentives. And then when you look at it as sort of an open source software, you know, like quite literally, like what's good for Bitcoin is selfishly in like the, you know, the best self-interest of of the user, of of your competitors, of your of of the business runners. And so we're seeing, you know, if you get involved and you get, you know, on this this hard money standard, you know, you got, you know, millions of dollars and, and potentially billions of dollars of like user activity being invested into the system to make your money better, even if you're just sitting on UTXOs and a hardware wallet and, hmm. you know, not actually actively, you know, engaging much yourself, your money is getting better with each improvement that happens to the system, each new business, each new use case. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a permissionless base layer. And, uh, you know, I think that's another part of the wrinkle of the, of the social fabric of Bitcoiners is that, you know, if, if, I think if you're really, you know, beyond even the, the economic, you know, you're, you are where we should be kind of free speech absolutists. And, and there's this censorship resistant quality to Bitcoin that is just simply not found on any other monetary standard. And of course there's moments of it, you know, cash is pretty cool, but is it, it's really government debt, you know, but it's mm. great to exchange very privately. Um, but it, you know, it's still your debt from, you know, a, I would say, frankly, you know, one of the biggest terrorist organizations in the world, the U S government, um, Bitcoin is so different from that. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's, it's, it's an interesting thing where, yes, we argue all the time on Twitter, but I think fundamentally, uh, you know, we want, we, we want this, we want everyone to succeed and have you know, unfettered access to stable monetary policy and and remove and neuter the state's ability to, you know, to pardon debt. Mm. Um, I think we all, you know, want that in our own ways, some more intensely, some less intensely. But there's this commonality there of, uh, you know, I think a lot of people got pushed into Bitcoin from the status quo being so predatorial. Um, and, you know, of course, we're all forced to speculate on the highly inflationary you know, monetary standard to just to keep up with inflation. 
And so when you're pushing and pushing and pushing everybody into this, you know, well, now we finally have a release valve and we finally have something that we can kind of get around um, and tangibly work at. Um, and it's cool that Bitcoin's code. It's cool because we can kind of look at it and see what needs to be done. We can see when we have stress tests like what we've been dealing with recently with this huge block size or sorry, block space demand. Um, you know, kind of this mania that's happening. And now we're seeing the realities of, okay, well, this is the perfect thing that could have happened because we know it's a short-term mania. We know there was some company doing a humongous mint and spending hundreds of Bitcoin doing this thing. Um, but that's what good demand is going to look like in five years if we have 5 billion people using Bitcoin, which, you know, we're Bitcoiners. We expect that. Mm -hmm. so now we got this nice little stress test where we can look and see, okay, how do we deal with this? Lightning mm -hmm. still requires... You know, settling to the main chain, opening and closing channels still requires paying fees. Um, but also, hey, did we maybe just solve this, uh, you know, maybe some of this security budget sort of falsehood concern mm -hmm. that people have as we approach the zero subsidy? Yeah, I think we kind of did. We at least got a, a, a snapshot of what things will look like in a few years. And we can see there are some there are some holes there that, you know, we need to fill. There are some uh, there's some realities we need to address with our scaling. Um, and it's so great that we got this little opportunity to kind of see, uh, you know, where the where the shortcomings are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, this ordinals and inscriptions debate has been yeah. quite uh, fiery, let's say, lately. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I have a relatively uninformed opinion. I haven't done a, a, a deep dive on it, but the way I currently see it, and again, you know, um, caveat in tour, I haven't done a deep dive on this, but you basically have another cohort bidding for block space, right? There's another group of people that want to use Bitcoin for, I guess, what do we call this? Inscription purposes. NFT purposes, whatever you want to call this. And that is making fees, right? There's more bids on base layer block space. So fees are being driven higher as a result. Um, there seems to be some complaints about that. The people are complaining that, uh, you know, p these users are spamming <laughs> the blockchain or space, but they're really just bidding, right? This is a free market process. And so people are mad that their their fees are going up. And now the, the net result of that, if I'm thinking about it correctly, is like, okay, well, block space is in higher demand. Therefore, that will push more development onto layer two, right? For people that want to transact more cheaply because base chain is becoming more expensive. More development on layer two leads to more of a build out of things like the Lightning Network which means more feature set, um, more channels to be funded. And when you fund channels, you're basically locking Bitcoin into those lightning channels. So you're taking it out of the market. You're creating more reservation demand for Bitcoin. And that obviously puts upward pressure on its purchasing power and price. So the net net on all of this is like, okay, more layer two development, more layer two feature set, more Bitcoin number go up. So I'm having a hard time seeing the complaint to the contrary. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. And then the other factors in that in it as well is sort of, um, you know, the, you're sort of incentivizing, you know, this new use case of, you know, hey, this is time chain. This is this is the truth, uh, you know, in a way that we've never experienced before. Um, there are a lot of applications for, uh, you know, purchasing, you know, immutable truth uh at, at a at a v you know a v byte per sat you know kind of rate and um these people that are in, you know inscribing data of things you know whatever it is the bible uh, uh stl gun files mm. uh you know uh you know cables like Wik wikileaks style kind of uh, uh government leaks mm. um uh, as well as obviously art you know the nft collectible thing which you know i'm not an nft person in any way at all um, I'm much more so interested in those other concepts, but any of these people that want to, you know, uh, you know, participate in this, in this kind of new use case of Bitcoin, although I would argue it's really not that new. Bitcoin's always been above block space, but, you know, fees are kind of a misnomer. It's really like 
the block space commodity, there's an auction every, you know, 10 minutes. And it's, you know, you want to get your censorship resistant transaction in, you have to buy up the space. It's always going to be at this dynamic fee market. But all these new participants that are coming into the system, whether who cares if they're coming from these altcoin shitcoin chains, you know, mm-hmm. they're coming back to Bitcoin. They're bringing their economic activity to Bitcoin. They're realizing that, you know, this NFT pointer bullshit on, on Ethereum is is ridiculous. It's not even on chain. It's not native. Mm-hmm. Wow, this actual on chain immutable, uh, you know, permanent data. Um, I'm going to run a full node uh, to be able to use the software and I'm going to obviously be not economically incentivized. The node isn't paying you, but if you want this data to be available, you're going to be incentivized to run a full archival node uh, as long as you want people to be able to access this data. So we're seeing more people coming to Bitcoin, bringing their economic activity to Bitcoin. We're increasing reachable node count. Uh, Block space demand is going up, which is something that of course, I think we would see eventually with the monetization of Bitcoin, but we're seeing it now earlier mm-hmm. um, and I help with subsidy happenings. Um, I'm kind of with you. It's, uh, you know, of course, I, I don't I don't like the fact that people are building tokens on Bitcoin and doing this kind of speculation that, you know, hey, we're trying to get away from all that, um, you know, but the Bitcoin is a permissionless layer. It's a public mm-hmm. good. Um, and and specifically the way inscription was were designed they were designed in a very careful way to be as low cost both to the user actually buying you know the witness data but but also more so to the nodes that have to store this data it's it's entirely prunable um it's it's hidden in this little op code envelope um that that basically tells your node not to spend any time validating it so it, it has very minimal validation costs on your node. You can prune it whenever you want, uh, you know, selectively, of course. Um, and uh, it doesn't bloat the UTXO set in some of the ways that, you know, previously arbitrary data has been stored in Bitcoin mm-hmm. uh, via op return or, you know, we've actually seen a new standard come out called stamps that actually imbues all the data into, uh, you know, actually into the, uh, the the transaction itself and creates this crazy you know, multi-sig UTXO with all of this arbitrary data filling the inputs. Um, and that's very lossy, I think, for the chain in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we don't we don't want to have the UTXO set bloat. And that's actually one of the reasons why the SegWit discount exists uh, is because we want to economically incentivize consolidation. And so, you know, you pay more in fees uh, if you have multiple inputs in your payment. You know, you know, Bitcoin transactions on the base layer obviously aren't priced in, you know, transactional value. It's your literal bit size, mm-hmm. byte size. And so when you have multiple inputs, you have to pay more because you have more signatures and you have you have more inputs. So the, the SegWit discount was very specifically chosen um, to to incentivize. Hey, OK, I have two UTXOs rather than just every single time I spend from my biggest UTXO. So it's one input and I leave a new change UTXO every time and blow out the UTXO set. Now I have this this uh, SegWit discount, this 4x discount, and now I'm economically incentivized to you know not create change every time and blow out the UTXO set. It's very important, um, and uh, it, it's it's very funny to see the the, the cycle of discourse on this. Um, you know, we're having people calling for rolling back the SegWit discount and let's roll back Taproot. Not even really understanding that Taproot really had very little to do with this even happening at all. Um, you know, Taproot just released some standardness bounds, but otherwise, you know, it made it a little bit cheaper. But you know, SegWit was really the state change to Bitcoin mm. that was that block extension introduced the SegWit discount, and still a soft fork. I mean, one of the most technically brilliant, you know, sort of ideas. Mm. Uh, we wanted a block size, despite. The block size increased despite what a lot of people kind of thought. The public really, you know, we kind of wanted it. After Satoshi, you know, left the one megabyte block in 2010, you know, block size 2010, um, it made a lot of sense. Um, and it was done in a way that obviously was totally backwards compatible. Um, old nodes could still look at the one megabyte, you know, uh, minus the, the witness data and validate all these blocks. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. 
the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version, because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin, and for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. So I, th I, just, I think it's uh, it's been one of the greatest things I think that's ever happened to Bitcoin in the sense of, yes, I do think there's obviously the speculation will be a short-term mania, um, but there are unbelievable use cases um, that we'll see, you know, sprawling out here. Um, mm -hmm. Sailor was just on a show and, and he was talking about inscribing your will. Mm -hmm. um, hey, if this is a billion dollar will, you know, you want to be very, very sure that this is immutably stored, um, you know, not just data durability, but immutability. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't got to tell you, we live in a world of mm -hmm. modulated truth. Uh, you know, everyone's uh, even in those leaks that came out in the in the uh, about the the kill the death ratio of in the Ukraine war. Um, you know, we had people on mainstream news showing leaks that had been edited, showing you know, incorrect numbers. Um, just because data is put in Bitcoin obviously doesn't make it true necessarily, true. but it makes it basically impossible or, or I would say literally impossible without, a, you know, a multi-million dollar reorg uh, or billion dollar reorg of, of actually changing that data. Um, and there's so many things that can happen downstream from that. Of course, the first things are going to be JPEGs and shit coins. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, how speculation and human greed sort of works. But like, 
what do we have left after this to, to, to build out? We yeah. could have bounty systems. We could have bulletin board, you know, kind of using Noster relays to create, you know, hey, I want to find this data that I can't get access to. I'm going to put up a, 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 a bounty. Someone has uh, this data. They inscribe it. Then I, they can send me the associated sat and I can pay them a Bitcoin transaction to pay them the bounty for uploading this data that I'm looking for. And then it's immutable and available and durable forever. Mm -hmm. um, so many interesting things that can come from it. Um, and it really like, you know, like what is, you know, no pun intended for your show, but like what is money? It, mm -hmm. It's like a trust communication, a technological tool to express volatility, you know, between two parties. Um, generally, you know, obviously, you know, economically in this been a bargaining problem kind of situation, but you know, that requires, uh, you know, the state change of this triple accounting ledger is, is this immutability and this uncensorability. Um, and that can be obviously applied to not just financial data, but just all kinds of data. Um, so I think we're going to see some really interesting stuff. Um, I don't think that it will ever obviously displace the point of Bitcoin, which is to, you know, neuter the, the, the state debt partners and create a, an actual scarce capped you know, uh, economic system. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, if they pay the fee, they get in the block and, right. you know, in many ways, it's a beautiful thing that so many people hate this and yet it's still going unstoppably. And, you know, so many important people in Bitcoin don't like this, you know, people very, you know, Luke, Luke Dashir Jr. Uh, or Def Dashir, um, you know, is very against, you know, this and very much so looks at it as, as, as spam. And, you know, he was obviously, you know, him and Peter, you know, were the ones kind of behind the SegWit soft fork. And again, I don't mean to, I'm not criticizing them in any way. I think they're incredible in so many ways, but there's a beauty, beautiful thing in Bitcoin that some of the most important developers in it have no say over how users use this public good. Um, and so I think there's a great discussion uh, to be had and we're going to keep, keep seeing it. And I do hope we move away from sort of just bastard bastardizing these ethereum use cases onto bitcoin i hope we move away from that but you know for now you know they pay the fee they want to pay our miners and subsidize our security uh and put their economic activity in the best money known to man i'm not going to stop them uh and and not only that i can't stop them. yeah it's really the fundamental beauty of this whole thing is whatever bitcoin is it's an open source tool and how that tool is used is ultimately up to each individual making use of it. And so what we get, like the collective outcome of that is, is Bitcoin is this consensus driven social construct. We, like who, who am I or who are you or who is anyone to say what it is or what it should be? That's like rendering a value judgment onto someone else. It's actually up to the users, right? Individually, they can use it for whatever Bitcoin is good to be used for. And wherever that consensus point moves sort of defines what Bitcoin actually is in, in the collective sense. And we've seen this censorship resistant quality. Um, you know, it's, it's not just like a pipe dream. It's like we've seen it in action, you know, last year um, with the, the trucker convoy in mm -hmm. Canada. That was, a, that was a use case where the state was actively shutting down payment processors, seizing bank accounts and, and seizing private companies, uh, or I'm sure the private company probably cooperated with governments, but, you know, shutting down these GoFundMes and, and, and what was left, uh, you know, to, to, to actualize these, you know, legitimate uh, financial, you know, payments and needs and services. And, and Bitcoin was all that was left. Um, and, 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 you know, I think over a million dollars was given out in that. I mean, it was an, it was a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, was handed to these to these truckers and was able to get them food and gas and all that. Um, and so it's like, you know, that those kind of things as we kind of get further and further into whatever we're going through as 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 a <laughs> as a world here, you know, we're gonna see more and more and more of that stuff, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, I know there's a lot of fear and a lot of talk about, you know, CBDCs and and of course I'm no fan of them, but it's like it's hard to really imagine us being more in a financial surveillance hell than we are already um 
you know, and Bitcoin really is this, uh, despite it being an open ledger, you know, I, I talk about it a lot as being transparency technology, but, uh, you know, it, it is, it is freedom tech, I think in, mm -hmm. in such a dream way. Um, and, uh, you know, we should be thankful every time that there's set, there's social, uh, you know, head butting in consensus. We should just be right. thankful at TikTok next block, you know? Yeah, exactly. It and that's, I think, the right way to look at it is the the ideological or social or opinion headbutting. It's through that frictional process that we arrive at the social consensus that becomes Bitcoin, right? It's just like any other market space. You, you want people competing and testing ideas against one another and finding out what works, right? And so this, the other benefit I, I'm perceiving here is this entire ordinals, inscriptions, NFTs, et cetera, whatever this alternative use case or use cases for Bitcoin, what they, what they are, it's also providing like another educational avenue for orange pilling people because there's many cohorts of the human race that might not give two shits about sound money, but maybe they're into NFTs or they're into, in, you know, inscriptions or whatever these alternative use cases are that they can then see the value in an immutable, unchangeable database that's a non-monetary use that just draws in more mind share, more demand, more education ultimately. So, I mean, I really see it as kind of just uh, another one of those developments that deepens my conviction in Bitcoin. Like all roads lead to Bitcoin, doesn't matter. Everything's good for Bitcoin. Doesn't matter if you think it's bad or not, it's somehow works out in Bitcoin's favor. There's no wrong way to get into Bitcoin, you know, it's like, and I, it, it, I think it's, it's really interesting too, when you look at it from, you know, well, first off, if you're a, if you're a monetary policy maximalist or whatever, like that comes downstream from protocol health and, and network health. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing reachable node counts, we're seeing economic energy kind of coming into the system. Um, it's all good for, for, you know, these financial monetary maximalists, mm -hmm. like these are all good things. Um, and there's also really kind of no such thing as a non-financial transaction, which is ironically NFT. There is really no such thing as a non-financial transaction on Bitcoin. I mean, you quite literally have to pay a fee. It is technically a payment no matter what um, to the miner. Um, and, and yeah, I just think in general, you're totally correct. There's, there's all roads lead to Bitcoin and, 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 and there's no wrong way to get into it. And, and also, you know, I think... Uh, you know, we, we have to kind of have our, 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 our mindset change a little bit for, um, I think we're all, of course, in many ways, the most we've ever been in the, then they fight you phase. Mm. Um, but also, you know, to get mass adoption is going to take, uh, you know, uh, uh, all different types of people. And I think that the sort of, uh, the ideological, um, Bitcoin or sort of of the past that was really defending this very small, vulnerable thing. Um, I think that's changed a bit. I mean, we've mm -hmm. just, we've monetized so extremely, uh, and, and, and there's such a, 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 a t just a, t it, it's dominates such a, a mind, um, a mind share of, of so much of, of the, the powers that be. I mean, we're, it's like mm -hmm. everyone's talking about Bitcoin now. Everyone's mm -hmm. talking about inflation. Banks are failing left and right. Um, and I think that the, the next wave of Bitcoiners are, are going to have totally different ideas of, of, uh, you know, I think the ANCAP kind of libertarian, um, I mean, I consider myself that, um, mm -hmm. in this history in school, you know, I think a lot of that will kind of give way to just like mom and dads that are trying to buy groceries and like kids that are in college trying to, you know, save their money from their, their weekend jobs. And it's gonna, it's gonna be less of a, like, um, an identity, like I am a Bitcoiner and that's my first identity to be right. like, oh, I'm a, I'm a you know, a guitar player at a bar gig on the weekends who happens to be a Bitcoiner. I'm a um, astrology student, um, astronomy student. I'm a, you know, whatever it is. It's like yeah. it, they're, it's kind of becoming this, um, you know, like, like the water is warm, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, if, yeah. So, like, in the same way, every modern individual is an internet user, right? right. Or every business is an internet business to the extent that, you use a smartphone or you pay bills online or you have a website, like whatever business you're in, you know, it can be the furthest thing from technology. You're making use of the internet as just a communication protocol. Um, I think 
that the same path is followed for Bitcoin, right? Everyone just, everyone that uses the internet, everything and everyone that the internet touches, Bitcoin will also touch. Because Bitcoin basically is the internet. It's just an extension of it um, into the economic domain. And this, yeah, this uh, vitriol, I guess, against condemned use cases is just silly. It, maybe it's a hangover from the block size wars where these guys really felt like they, which they did at, at a certain era in Bitcoin's history, you needed to defend the network and, and be toxic and all of these things. But I've thought this for a long time, that if Bitcoin does succeed in the way that Bitcoiners think it will succeed, and it standardizes and ossifies as this primary economic protocol, the, the internet of money, right? That all of that behavior becomes pointless because the thing is so it's the standard it's a standard it's yeah. like it's already fully embedded and can't be it's fully enmeshed in in human socioeconomic reality so you know for the same reason there aren't toxic http maximalists you won't really have toxic bitcoin maximalists because it's just an enmeshed standard totally. and so maybe that's it we're just seeing the cultural transformation as bitcoin outgrows its its prior self you know it's kind of like a snake shedding its skin something like that i mean i, I always joke like you know in in 10 years or something you know it, it, being called bitcoin magazine might be kind of like <laughs> cheeky and dumb where it's just like it yeah. just be like being like money magazine you know yeah like i'm gonna walk around with t-shirts that basically just say money on them or whatever you know yeah. it's like i think you know there's a lot of fight left to be done i sure. absolutely that and, and you know and i have a ton of respect in, in so many ways um even if i have some disagreements here or there on a couple of things but i am you know I, I have to you know give so much appreciation and thanks you know for the the toxic you know these plebs that that have fought against a lot of these things the people that yeah of course block says where it's like you got to tip your hat and mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope in many ways that you know those folks never change in a lot of ways mm -hmm. but i also think that just the reality of the next people that are coming in um, and so it's like we as a community sort of have to kind of we have to butt our heads. We have to talk about these mm -hmm. things. Well, what part of the ordinals things is cool? Mm -hmm. Inscribing immutable data is cool. Is making a shit coin and selling it for expectations of profit to like unknowing, uh, you know, market participants like that's not that cool. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like we kind of have to get through this and talk about all these things that, you know, we we want to instill as kind of a moral floor. Uh, it, it, as Bitcoin expands to being far beyond, you know, kind of this uh, homogenous Bitcoiner. Yeah. Uh, and I'm again, I'm not like trying to push the toxic thing away. Like, I, I have a lot of uh, of compassion and empathy for that mindset, and I think it comes from a very, very good place. Uh -huh. I also think sometimes it 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 goes against those goals. Um, and I think just right now, it's a, it's a good time where we have a little bit of a lull. Some of the interest mm -hmm. isn't necessarily there because of some bear stuff. And we have an ability to kind of look at the culture and be like, well, let's skate to where the puck is going to be. Yeah. What is a big going to look like in five years? Like, I don't think they're going to be the laser eyed carnivore Austrian, you know, this kind of homogenous mm -hmm. thing. Not that I don't love all those things, but it's just like. I, I think it's we're you know and we're already seeing it. You yeah, know, this is why we go to Miami. This is why we go to meetups and things. It's like I have all these new like Gen Zers that are coming to meetups now that are like teaching me interesting TikTok lingo and all this shit. Mm -hmm. And they're like savage Bitcoiners, but they're like so nice and open and and they'll mm -hmm. happily sit down and talk to a, a, a proof of stake head and explain yeah. why Bitcoin's better. You know, and it's like that stuff. That stuff's cool. I'm excited for that. That this new class. You know. Yeah, yeah. The, this Bitcoin is just bigger than any cultural norm because Bitcoin is global money, right? So, in theory, it subsumes all cultures over time. And and I agree. Like the toxic maximalism is very much a cultural immune system for the network. It's been indispensable to its formation so far. But this is all context driven, right? And there's when Bitcoin is sick, maybe, or it's being attacked. Well, that immune system is very important. But when it's thriving and, and growing, then maybe it's not so important. And you just have to accept that, right? It's just people are, what is, what's the old saying, right? Bitcoin doesn't, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. So you just got to kind of let it 
do its thing and accept that your cultural ner- norms aren't going to be the only cultural norms for Bitcoin as it becomes global money. I mean, it's not even possible. And I would say it's like, I think, I think there's like a growing voice uh, kind of in the, in like kind of the lefty Bitcoiner community that's like really anti a lot of the toxicity and kind of this mm-hmm. new progressive thing, which I'm all for. I, I totally, you know, I'm, I'm a free speech absolutist and I love everyone to Bitcoin because I lived in the Bay Area for, you know, a decade now. And when I moved here, I was like, absolutely, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty like, uh, you know, right down the middle kind of lib. And uh-huh. getting into Bitcoin, going through living in the most expensive city in America, basically, uh, and being a, you know, I was a service industry worker um, and kind of going through that experience, watching the tech boom explode, watching, you know, all my friends start, you know, having substance issues and seeing people uh-huh. on the street, watching San Francisco kind of turn. And then obviously with the coat, the lockdowns, I mean, uh-huh. and mandates and stuff it's like these are bars that i helped build uh you know not build but build the community around and and you know was a, a big essential part of and now i can't even walk in the door um and going through that whole transitive experience and and, and having bitcoin there as kind of this like you know uh, i was a, a an alcoholic bartender with substance problems <laughs> you know six years ago i got into bitcoin and now i've been sober for you know five years or about to be five years and uh you know bitcoin's changed my life and now i would say i'm you know (laughs) absolutely in the uh you know i've moved away from a lot of my political beliefs because i've just experienced them not working Mm -hmm. uh say that with all due respect um but it's it's i've just seen so many failures against my friends my friends businesses my whole industry uh Mm -hmm. i went to for music i'm a you know performing artist while doing you know, bartending stuff on the side. And I just watched my whole industry just get destroyed. Right. Um, it's like, okay, now I've kind of, I've, I've actually been able to pick up so much of the Bitcoin ethos from my toxic friends. Like I remember the first time I read Svetsky's remnant piece, mm-hmm. I was kind of, I don't know about this one, man, this is just kind mm-hmm. of intense. And then I thought about it more and I was like, no, actually I need I needed to read that. Like, this is a reminder yeah. that we can't save everybody. And and, and and we can only kind of awaken the people that are ready for it. And that's actually the, the kindest thing you that's can right. do. You force this down people's throats. And, and so now my whole political ideology has changed. Um, I don't know what it is now, but I know I'm a Bitcoiner. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I hope I hope more people can kind of get through that journey and then see this big, giant, decentralized network of truth uh, waiting there for them. Um, and I hope they can experience the cycle kind of safely and, and see how their life can change. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's incredible. Uh, it really deep politicizes your worldview where it seemed to be the only, well, maybe not the only, but it seemed to be the commonly understood solution prior to Bitcoin that you just had to get politically active to, you know, change the rules and blah, blah, blah. But Obviously, that just doesn't work because it involves coercion. It involves, and you, you can't coerce people into conformity. I mean, it just fundamentally doesn't work. It reminds me of this. There's a song by the Police yeah. called "Spirits in the Material World," and the the opening lyrics of that song says, "There is no political solution to our troubled evolution. Have no faith in constitution. There is no bloody revolution." And so it's like Bitcoin is that, it's that apolitical solution, a bloodless revolution, and it's changing everything and everyone inside and out. And um, it sounds l- literally unbelievable if, you're, if you haven't done the work to start to understand Bitcoin, but if you've gone across that chasm, right, of whatever it is, 100 some odd hours of study, then I think you'll see Bitcoin really is promises at least to be that thing that that fixes so many things. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, This is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. 
Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Absolutely. And it creates this like cooperative game um, of, uh, you know, our, our, our oppression is uh, our oppressors are unified. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are. It's this. I mean, I don't think it's the easiest time in the world ever to to sort of be able to point that out to people, um, you know. But like, conspiracy is a real thing. Uh, there's a great Assange piece in the next magazine, "Conspiracy as Governance," that talks a lot about this. But you know, our 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 oppressors are unified, and our revolutions are sort of innately not in many mm -hmm. ways pockets of 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 unif unification. But, um, you know, when we're under, you know, basically a one world empire context uh, in this U.S. dollar system, um, you know, it's really hard to actually be able to uh, have any sort of meaningful unification against, um, you know, these these, you know, these systemic structures that control our entire lives who are also spitting out, you know, counter opposition um, and counterintelligence stuff like to our communities. Mm -hmm. Seeing these revolutions be co-opted time and time again. We saw the hippies in the 60s be replaced with like, you know, hey, do a ton of LSD and lose your mind and MK Ultra and all this stuff in the 70s. We saw even now people are getting hip to the Dalai Lama being, you know, paid 15K a month by the CIA from <laughs> the late 50s into the 70s. It's like, oh, okay, that's why we had a pro-Vietnam Dalai Lama, you know. Um, <laughs> Noam Chomsky. We're seeing this come out where it's like, oh, he was meeting with Epstein and, and stuff all the time. And he was yeah. not it's 9-11 truth. And, you know, what, what what's kind of going on here? What, what is this controlled dissonance that's kind of going on? And Bitcoin is is this sort of cooperative game uh, that gets everybody together selfishly to be, uh, you know, contributing to, you know, sort of the best thing we can kind of, you know, the, the, you know, the most selfishly unified. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it really is this, uh, uh, you know, incentives are really everything and the structure of how incentives are built, um, you know, dictate human action. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't perfectly, you know, predict human action. When you build this. Once you put something out in the world, just like I'm sure Satoshi didn't expect ordinals. Um, but, you know, here we are. And, and, and the incentives that were built with the SegWit discount has led to ordinals. Bitcoin's incentives are, you know, to... Uh, y y to, to preserve your wealth and do whatever you can in the best way to, you know, improve the network, whether that's, uh, you know, literally with code or, or orange pilling, you know, your friends. It's like you're economically incentivized in a cat money system mm -hmm. to, to orange pill your friends. It's, it's a selfless, selfish act that's actually a very selfless act. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't happen very often, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so, <clears throat> just fascinating. And I, just a real, real rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, okay, let's maybe come back up to the surface a bit here. Yeah. Uh, you guys, Bitcoin Magazine, have released a new issue called the Gatekeepers issue. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what what's that all about? Um, I think you said Julian Assange is on the cover. Um, what, what is, what's new about this issue and, and what is it, uh, what are, what does it mean when we say the gatekeepers, 
I mean, I think I've got a, a good idea, but for the audience, what do you what do you mean yeah, totally. when you say gatekeepers? Uh, so you know, we we always like to try to find a little uh, you know a clever phrase or kind of this um, you know something that can be kind of applicable to a lot of different things that are going on, loosely timely. You know, we're a quarterly mm-hmm. editorial, so you know we're not able to exactly drop you know timely news stories. You know, everything because it's it's a it's a it's a it's basically a coffee table book. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Times yeah. a year. Um, but you know, that said, you know, we we obviously, you know, we look we look ahead again to try to skate where the puck is gonna be and and we just kind of uh you know, we, we had just done this banking uh sort of uh excuse me, not banking, but sort of this fraudulent media FTX explosion, um mm-hmm. rather. Um we had just done this broke issue. Um, and we were kind of just like looking at, you know, what were kind of the things everyone was talking about. Their Twitter files were starting to go down. We were starting to see um, a lot of people with Elon buying Twitter, you know, kind of coming back that had been deplatformed. We were sort of mm-hmm. seeing a rise and, you know, rumble and kind of some of these alternative media things. Obviously, culminating, we just saw, you know, Tucker just came back from, you know, the biggest you know, mainstream media show. And now he's just doing his own thing on Twitter. You know, we're, it, it, it's very obvious that we're kind of seeing this, uh, um, you know, people trying to, uh, to get around these, um, these, these cultural curators and kind of, mm-hmm. uh, gatekeepers, frankly. Um, and, and you see it in, in, in so many different ways, whether it's obviously, of course, monetarily, um, but 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 obviously culturally, you know, humongously so, and and the information sort of, uh, you know, ironically, kind of with the internet, you know, the more connected we are, we have so many abilities to uh, subvert kind of traditional propaganda techniques, a la like in the '40s, you know, we'd go to a movie theater and they'd show us absolutely absurd, racist, insane propaganda films mm-hmm. to get us to go want to go, you know, nuke Japan or whatever. Um, nowadays we can Skype someone in Japan and be like, do you want to kill me? No, you don't. Okay. Just these crazy guys that run our country do great. Okay, cool. Averted. But now we all have screens in our, in our hands. Now we all have, you know, I'm looking at like four screens right now. Yeah. Um, you know, so many other outlets to sort of directly, um, you know, get at, get at people. So, um, there's just a lot of stuff to talk about, um, within that and how it relates to Bitcoin, how it relates to the powers that be that, um, you know, a lot of people are waking up to some kind of heavy stuff. It's like, you know, people are really beginning to see that there's some there's some strange, uh, you know, systemic boogeymen um, that have been kind of pulling the strings for a long time. And then, of mm-hmm. course, not all gatekeeping is bad. You know, mm-hmm. like yeah. I really appreciate the fact that you know you you have uh, brought me on brought you brought me on your show. You know, I I also have to gatekeep when I uh, pick and choose pieces that I want to go in the magazine. Uh-huh. Late night DJs, you know, go into your record store back, you know, 20 years ago and go in to talk to the guy that you think has good taste telling you what to listen to or whatever. It's like there's there's a lot of positive curation as well. Uh-huh. Uh, and I don't I, you know, I think I think we kind of hit it timely um, in the sense that I think Bitcoin is going through a, a very big gatekeeper discussion, um, yeah. you know, because the, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, your your nodes, your rules and you're allowed to set your mempool policy to to censor these transactions and not and not uh, relay them if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean anyone else is going to do that. But like you, you have every right to do that. You have every right to prune your node and not and not hold on to these things. So like you're your own gatekeeper of so many things in a very mm-hmm. positive way. And Bitcoin actually allows you to be a more efficient gatekeeper of your own funds. You can actually self custody uh, financial property, which is uh, you know. That, that 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 that's that's a state change in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the magazine is always uh you know we we look for kind of a a, a big broad stroke um phrase that we can kind of apply to a few things, and then um yeah we kind of write this uh my my process is sort of uh I, I always think of uh, Ridley Scott when he was directing Blade Runner, he carried around a little uh, portrait in his in his pocket of uh, Nighthawks at the Diner that that uh, Hopper piece painting. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, his North Star. So whenever uh, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a PA or whatever, someone, a stagehand would come over and be like, hey, how do I, you know, I'm setting these lights. What do you think? He would pull out the picture and look at it. And that would dictate his choice. Um, and so one of the first things we kind of do is we write this North Star document that ends up being the letter from the editors. Um, and then we kind of send it out to a bunch of people. 
Um, and we talk to them. We do an open call for submissions every time. You know, we're a free speech platform. You're a LARP if you don't extend yourself out, you know, and, and, and close the gate. You know, you got you got to open the gate. Um, so send it out to a bunch of, uh, you know, great, great authors. We have so many contributors in the Bitcoin Magazine family. Um, and then, you know, a couple of recurring um, columnists. Um, and then, uh, you know, we kind of, you know, my main thing is like, hey, I want writers to write about what they have experienced directly, what they care about, what they're interested in. Because I know for myself as a writer, if I don't give a shit about the topic, I, 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 I probably won't even write the piece. You know, it's like yeah. it has to be that's really burning out of me that I think needs to be talked about or done. So I want to offer that same respect to authors. So get that little you know, North star there. And then we, we bounce it off and, um, we were really lucky this time, um, you know, with the, uh, with the gatekeeper issue that, uh, we were able to talk to, to, to Gabriel Shipton and Stella Assange, Gabriel being, um, uh, Assange's brother and Stella, his wife. Um, and we were able to do an interview and talk to both of them. Um, and we have this wonderful, uh, core story cover story by Peter Chihuahua talking, you know, called free Assange. Um, that talks about a lot of, a lot of his, uh, I mean, he was a, obviously a, a, you know, a legendary cryptographer, mm -hmm. um, and invented a lot of really interesting tools, um, like this tool rubber hose, which, you know, WikiLeaks used to that, where you could, you know, basically, you know, use fake keys to, um, you know, to, to partially encrypt or rather decrypt an encrypted file. If you were like in a torture scenario where you were being asked to decrypt these files, you could use a fake password and you know show a fake um you know decryption mm -hmm. uh of all of these really really fascinating things um and so peter did a great job um sort of covering that story uh, we have a piece i mentioned it earlier actually uh, conspiracy as governance assange wrote it um in the mid 2000s under a pseudonym but it's since been you know recognized as him and it talks about you know a lot of this um you know, sort of this, uh, yeah, that that conspiracy is not innately this, um, you know, ephemeral thing. It's actually a very tangible thing. Um, and the the unified oppression sort of against us is is, you know, using these very specific tactics um, and we need to kind of use them back at the powers that be. So it talks a lot about a lot of strategies about addressing conspiracy. Mm -hmm. um, and again, conspiracy just meaning kind of, you know, unified um you know, dialectics and, and actions. Uh -huh. uh, so there's just uh, so much stuff crammed in here. Um, I think it's my favorite magazine that we've done. And I know that's obviously an expected thing that you would hope someone would say as they're kind of <laughs> shilling a new product. But um, I'm really proud of it. Um, I think it's uh, there's there's a how to use PGP guide in there. There's cryptographic games where you can get a seed phrase and kind of learn how to, um, you know, use a lot of these cryptographic tools you know within the puzzles that i think if you really read the magazine and took took kind of what you needed out of it you kind of have all the tools you need um mm -hmm. to be a self-sovereign internet explorer which is uh it gets harder and harder every day to kind of do that as more metadata is released and more data uh, is being you know sucked up by these information wells so mm -hmm. i think Assange is, is a story that we all need to to, to really pay attention to and and it's it, it's wild that he's been in jail now for four years and obviously been exiled longer than that. Um, and it's it's disgusting. It's incredibly uh, inhumane. Uh, he's a journalist. Um, you know, we got these jabronis going up there saying that, you know, we're a democracy and that the, you know, the guy on the other side of the aisle is, is, a, is against democracy and it's a threat to our democracy. And it's like, well, we don't even have a repress. And right. you, you, can't, you can't have informed consent if you don't have a free press. And if we have a journalist in jail uh, due to journalism exposing war crimes to the U.S. government, mm -hmm. um, we don't have a free press. It's it's basically as simple as that. And and right. anyone on any side of the aisle saying anything other than that, um, you know, is not our friend and not you know not someone that we should trust. Um, and so I think it's just a big reminder. Um, you know, we gotta. You know, we our our brother is in jail. Um, yeah. And we can't just keep dilly dallying and going about our day. We need to get this guy out of jail. He has kids. He has a wife. Yeah. He has family. And uh, he's a journalist. And it's insane that he's in jail. Yeah, in jail for telling the truth is a testament to how far we have drifted uh, as a society. Seriously. Mark, man, I think that is probably a good place to call it. Um, this is a really fun conversation. 
I appreciate you doing it. I'm super excited to be in Miami. Um, we're actually leaving tomorrow. So we're going in like a week early to do a bunch of interviews and I am just thrilled, honestly. It's always a good time hanging out with Bitcoiners. Dude, it's the best, man. Oh, I really, really appreciate you bringing me on. I know, yeah, you're leaving tomorrow. So I'm sure, uh, I'm sure life's hectic. <laughs> I really appreciate the love and, um, yeah, I, I'm excited to, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll connect in, in Miami for sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, let me know if you ever want to drop some alpha in the magazine, man. I'd, I'd, I'd be honored. I love your work. Uh, we, we'd love to have you. Yeah, it's been a while. I'll have to do something with you guys again soon. Um, could you quickly let my audience know where they could find you on the internet? Yeah, 100%. Obviously, bitcoinmagazine.com. Got a lot of articles online there, um, but I do run the print magazine. You can grab that at store.bitcoinmagazine.com. I'm obviously going to be at Miami Bitcoin 2023 next week. Be on the main stage doing some fun stuff with Whitney Webb, uh, Luke Radowski, Joe Nakamoto, a bunch of great legends over there. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Mark Good W underscore I N, Mark Goodwin with the underscore between the W and the I N. And you can follow the uh, print magazine at the BTC Mag. And uh, yeah, come say hi, come to a meetup. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you doing this.